we know that early detection saves lives and that, you know, by skipping a mammogram, we potentially could see later stage cancers that will have more aggressive treatments and more mo morbidities and mortalities. We learned this the hard way during the COVID pandemic. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Radiology Report podcast, where we are having conversations with the leaders transforming radiology today. You can find us on radiologyreportpodcast.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Daniel Arnold. Today, we are joined by Dr. Robin Roth. Dr. Roth is a board-certified radiologist specializing in breast and abdominal imaging and image-guided procedures. She completed her radiology residency and women's imaging fellowship at the Hospital of University of Pennsylvania in 2014. My wife's alma mater, great program, big fan. <laughs> Mary's still there, still still killing it. Dr. Roth recently created and runs the Booby Docs. You can't see what I can see because you guys are all listening to this, but she's sitting in front of us in the Booby Docs studio, which has this amazing Booby Docs logo, which is surrounded by what I can only describe as lots of breasts. Um, and scars and scars and, and breasts scars. And, st and stars so scars uh, yeah yeah oh That's scars the, scars the scars are me. the important part yeah and so we'll talk we'll talk all about that and this is a popular social media destination where she discusses breast cancer um, in a fun educational and approachable way to reach women everywhere so i'm really excited to have you on the show welcome Thank you so much. I'm a big fan of yours. And um, it's exciting to be a guest on another podcast because you know I run a podcast as well. So always yeah, a podcast. Yeah, you're on the other never... side of it. You're on yeah. the other side of it today. I get to be in the driver's <laughs> seat. So, like you know, it. we'll get into all sorts of stuff today. You know, want to hear about your career, what motivated you to um, get into this field and, and, you know, what you've been up to lately, um, as well as hear a little bit about your thoughts on advocacy, as well as sort of building brand and finding personal fulfillment in this, in this job. But first, how are you? I, I just shared before we started how I am, which involved <laughs> getting vomited on by not once, but twice last night by my, my oldest son. Um, uh, are you doing a little better than, than me this morning? You know, um, the vomit really kind of seals the deal. You win with that one. But I am a few, I am a few days post-op carpal tunnel surgery, which mean, many radiologists are probably affected by. So I had carpal tunnel surgery three days ago on my right hand. I've been having it for years. I got worse with every pregnancy and I've had a few steroid injections and ultimately they were like, this, you need to get the surgery. So I had it, I, I'm feeling good. I'm sore, but feeling good, better than I, the, the carpal tunnel syndrome had gotten really bad. So I'm happy to relieve those symptoms. Well, good to hear that that you're feeling better. I'd never heard of that before. So the pregnancy exacerbates the carpal tunnel? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, radiologists might know that, you know, the carpal tunnel is a very tight sheath kind of through your wrist where the ulnar and radial nerves go through. And over time, especially it gets worse. I think as radiologists were affected to, by this because of the scrolling and especially with the biopsies as a breast radiologist. I never had it until I got pregnant. And I think that something with the swelling with the pregnancy, it just, it always was exacerbated during pregnancy and kind of never went away. You, you know, actually I had a few ultrasound guided steroid injections, which some radiologists do do, but you're only maxed at three um, injections. So after my third injection, I needed uh, to get my surgery. I actually needed it on both sides, but I decided, and I would recommend this to anyone who ever needs it, is to only do one side at a time because you don't realize how dependent you are on your hands. So having one hand out is hard, but having two hands out is impossible. My uh, friend who had it, she's like, my husband had to wipe my butt for a few days. So that was, <laughs> uh, you don't think about that. <laughs> From wiping toddlers' butts to wiping partners' <laughs> yeah. butts. The, the butt wiping will never end, it seems. It never goes away. <laughs> <laughs> So no, the, but I'm doing okay. Yeah. How, how long, how many days post-surgery are you? I'm like three. So I'm pretty. And, and when do you feel like you're, you'll be back to fighting shape? You know, I don't know. I'm going to take it easy because I overuse everything. Like, yeah. I, I think that as you know, we're just constantly pushed and we, we push ourselves until we kind of break. And I, I'm, I'm tired of doing that. So I'm going to make sure I fully re rehab and take a few weeks to recover from this Are there, surgery. this is, you know, deep in the weeds, but I'm curious, are there things that you think you can do in your clinical practice to oh. be more <laughs> adaptable around this? Yeah. 
I think that every person should be having an ergonomic mouse. So there are mice that are designed to kind of alleviate some of the pressure on that carpal tunnel. So I got that after I was diagnosed, but I think prophylactically, like young in your career, you should do that. And also they have, you know, those mouse pads that have that little bit of cushioning on the wrist, things like that, small changes that you can make. I know, I know ultrasound techs are very prone to carpal tunnel just because the way they hold the probe. So it, mm. it kind of comes with the job a little bit, but there are things that you could do by being aware of it to, you know, improve your longevity over time. Yeah. Good advice. And we'll, we'll have yeah. to do a whole, a whole podcast. <laughs> we can do a whole another. Ergonomic, That's right. Ergonomic. So if you're an ergonomics expert listening to the show, please reach out. So let's get into it a little bit. Where are you from? And spoiler alert, you're from South Florida, yeah. which made us instant best friends because I'm also from South Florida. So how did uh, mm -hmm. South Florida Robin find her way to now Philly and, you know, being a radiologist? Yeah. So I grew up in South Florida, not so far from you. My whole family is from Florida and I grew up there, went to University of Florida. I always had a dream to like move to New York though. So thankfully, after graduating from the University of Florida, I was lucky enough to get accepted to Albert Einstein College of Medicine in the Bronx, New York, which was such an amazing experience for me. I really feel like that was a very formative four years of my career. I met some really incredible people, including my best friend and now still colleague, Dr. Adrian Rosenthal. We like met the first day of med school, hit it off, and now she's a breast radiologist and we work together. And she's actually the S in the booby docs, but she doesn't do social media anymore. We'll talk about that. But yeah, so it's actually my 15 year med school reunion on Tuesday. Oh, wow. So it's hard to believe. So I got transplanted to New York and there I really decided to go into radiology for a number of reasons. I went into med school thinking I wanted to be a pediatrician. And then like many people, I realized that you're really dealing with the parents when you're a pediatrician. And for me, I thought that the kids were either too sick or too well. And someone's like, if you want to help kids, have kids of your own, right? If you love kids, <laughs> have kids of your own. And, and also choose a job that lets you see those kids. So that kind of stuck with me. And then there was really a point in my career that was pivotal for me to going into radiology, which was I was on my surgery rotation and I really loved connecting with the patients. And there was this man on the rotation and he had just been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. The radiologist played a big part in it because, you know, they showed us the images and why it was pretty aggressive and why he only, you know, had a few months to live. And so I was with the team when we told him and that was, you know, watching him kind of process everything was hard and being told he only has a few months to live. And his biggest concern was that he had a mentally challenged brother that he needed to take care of. So he wanted to get his things in order. And I remember I was helping him with social work stuff and things like that. And then the next morning I walked into work and he coded overnight and I was not okay. Like I took that one really hard because, you know, I had just kind of developed this relationship with him and we you know, he had a few months to live and he kind of accepted that. And then he's out overnight. So like, I took that really hard and I kind of processed all of it and realized that I take all this stuff home with me. I'm a very empathetic person. And I realized I needed to kind of be one step removed from patients. And that's how I kind of found my way to radiology. So for me, it felt right. Like I love that I got to work with other doctors and be an important piece of the healthcare team, but also not have to take it home with me so much. And ultimately my cousins, I'm very close to my first cousins. And while I was in residency, one of them found a lump when she was in her early thirties that they, you know, they told her it's probably benign and will follow it in six months. And she pushed for the biopsy and it ended up being a triple negative breast cancer. So a very aggressive form of breast cancer. And she ended up going through treatment. And at the end of the day, they tested her for BRCA and she ended up being BRCA2 positive. And then her sister, who was a little bit older, got tested early and she had breast cancer and was BRCA2 positive. So while I'm in my radiology training, my two first cousins were diagnosed with breast cancer and BRCA. And that was what ultimately led me to breast radiology because I wanted to help women like them. So they're still 15 years later doing wonderful. They were just on my oh, wow. podcast recently and they're so proud of like me and the booby docs. And they always say, this is like my grandma's dream. 
that this is kind of how I involved it all. So that's the long story. My husband actually is from South Florida too. And he was at University of Florida, same time, went on to med school in Philly and went, chose to be a radiologist. And we met actually after we both matched for radiology at different programs. But it's a long story. So did you have to do long distance during all of training? Yeah. So we actually met during intern year. And the crazy part about that is that I graduated from Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And I was going to do my radiology residency at Montefiore. So, but Adrian, my best, the the S, I'm going to call her (laughs) the tall booby doc. She was going to do radiology in Philly. And she convinced me to do one year and transitional year in Philly. So I moved to Philly for that one year. And the day I moved to Philly, he moved from Philly to Chicago for his one year. No. But, his, but his best friend was in my program. He's like, you have to meet my friend Howard. He's a radiologist. He's a gator. He's Jewish. He's, a, you know, you guys are a perfect <laughs> fit. And we actually met kind of long distance. I was in Philly. He was in Chicago. And then we both moved back to our respective programs for residency. So I moved back to New York the day he moved back to Philly. So we essentially were long distance that way. But something incredible happened. So we were dating long distance, New York, Philly during our first year of radiology. And then the most miraculous thing happened, which was a spot opened up at Penn Radiology. And somehow I found out about it through word of mouth. They weren't even advertising. And I transferred to University of Pennsylvania Radiology for my R2 year through our, like the rest of my training. Sure. Amazing. It was so, incredible. Uh, you and I have this in common being married to radiologists. What's it yes. like? <laughs> What's it like being married to a radiologist? Any any advice for the radiology spouses out there? Well, it's great. If you can marry another radiologist, I am all for it. <laughs> like I think I think radiology is a great field and obviously you have the potential to, you know, work at home and work a little bit more. I think telemedicine is increasing as from COVID. So that's really great. I mean, we work together in radiology. Now we're both working together, but of course I do breast and he does abdominal and nuclear medicine. So we actually don't get to see each other that often in the reading room. I may be at the hospital once every two weeks. For the most part, I work in an outpatient center, but it's nice to, you know, every so often I'll show him cases, which is great, get his opinion, especially when I'm on body and I could show him. It's nice to have a second set of eyes, but I mean, it's great. It's Radiology is a great career for anyone, especially if your spouse is going to do it too. So tell us a little bit about your current practice. Where are you today? You're, is it academic? Is it private? Kind of how, how do you fill your time? So I work in a hospital in um, Southern New Jersey. So right outside of Philly, it's kind of a hybrid practice. It's academic, but it also feels like private practice where I'm located because I do breast imaging. So I essentially like run a breast imaging center. So it's a great combination of both. We also have a residency with five residents a year now. It's kind of increased every year. Uh, My husband did his residency here as well. And I actually started a breast imaging fellowship a few years ago. So now I serve as the breast imaging fellowship director. So I'd say it's a perfect combination of academic and private practice. Like it feels like I'm private practice when I'm seeing my patients and they come to clinic and I work them up and manage them. But it also feels academic that I get to do all this amazing teaching and training of fellows. How do you how do you typically split your time? I mean, all the training for radiology residents and you know, especially the fellowship is hands-on training. So you know, it's mostly like going to work. Okay, teaching at the workstation through, yeah. yeah lots of hands-on training especially with biopsies and you know with, especially with breast radiology it's a lot of hands-on learning and I love that like I love teaching at the workstation and you know progressively integrating residents and fellows into biopsies and ultimately you know they're independent by the end it's yeah. great I feel like a so- proud mama when that happens <laughs> So in addition to your work in the practice, you also do a lot on advocacy. What drives your passion in this area? I know you talked a little bit maybe about some of your personal experiences through your family, but maybe there's others as well. And what are some of the major things you're advocating for? So it's a great time to be a breast imaging advocate because there's lots of conflicting recommendations and political undertones of everything in breast imaging, and it's really dangerous, actually. So I feel like I have a really important message 
and I have the expertise behind me and I have the experience behind me that I feel like completely just well suited to just take on this really important topic. So just to go over a little bit of the breast, like for those who are not in the know on breast cancer screening recommendations. So a lot of societies, including the American College of Radiology have always recommended 40 every year to get screening mammogram. And this is for average risk women. There's definitely a large percentage of people that need to screen earlier because they're high risk. And we'll talk about that. But back in 2016, I think things got very confusing when the US Preventive Task Force changed the long standing recommendations from 40 every year to 50 every two years and stopping at age 74, which is crazy for a number of reasons. We know that young women, the 40 year old population is more likely to get aggressive disease and starting mammography at age 40 saves the most lives, most life years. You know, breast cancer in the 40 year old women is a huge problem. About 12,000 women each year are diagnosed with breast cancer under the age of 45. We see it every day in our practice. You know, breast cancer in their 40s, it's like one in, in six cases. So it's not small. And obviously women in their 40s that are diagnosed with breast cancer have a lot to lose. You know, a lot of times they're working individuals, they're a huge member of the workforce, they have young children, they have a lot of life years to live. And like I said, they tend to get more aggressive cancers. And also, young women are more likely to have dense breast tissue. So one, not including the 40 year olds is a big mistake. And also the two year interval is way too long. So going back to the recommendation. So recently, as of like two weeks ago, US Preventive Task Force changed their recommendations back to starting at 40. They said that new data has come out to show that there is a benefit in breast cancer screening in women with their 40s, which we've been saying all along, like well, advocates like I, me. If I was reading this all correctly, they basically admitted that in the seven year gap when they changed the policy that they made a mistake and that yes. there have been increased deaths and yes. that yes. they need to reverse the policy to prevent deaths. Quite right. plainly. Especially for women in their 40s, like that they were now no longer screening. And it was causing confusion, just widespread confusion. So yes, the reason that they changed it to 50 was not to decrease the amount of death. All societies, even them, agreed that starting at 40 saves the most lives. What they were pointing to were the potential harms, right? So that starting in your 40s, it exposes you to more mammograms over your lifetime, which we know are very low dose the higher likelihood of being called back for a false positive or something that's not cancer, which we know this because young women are more likely to have dense breast tissue and have no comparison. Yeah. So that's not a good reason to screen. We know that you're gonna have a higher callback rate. They were projecting that this may lead to unnecessary workups and biopsies that may lead to anxiety. Okay, so anxiety, placing their values on breast cancer screening recommendations for women. We would never do this for men and prostate cancer screening. You know, 40 saves the most lives, but let's set up, start at 50 because men are just, we don't want to bother them. They're too anxious. Don't, you know, don't worry your, hmm. don't you worry your pretty little head about breast so cancer. So you think there's some gendered biases that oh. drove these types of decisions? Yeah, it's a very paternalistic approach, right? Hmm. Give the women the information and let them decide how often they're going to come in. You know, you the recommendation should reflect the most life-saving information. Okay, so recently they changed it. Like, so they recognize that there, there is increased death by starting at 50, especially in the young population. So they changed it back to 40. But what the problem is, is that the screening interval did not change. So it's still every two years. Mm -hmm. And that Why is, is that too long. Problem? It's a, it's a problem because we know that early detection saves lives and that, you know, by skipping a mammogram, we potentially could see later stage cancers that will have more aggressive treatments and more mo morbidities and mortalities. We learned this the hard way during the COVID pandemic, right? Mm. So when women skip, skip a mammogram, they are more likely to have more advanced disease. I saw one yesterday. She came a year and a half ago. It was completely normal, completely normal, not a myth. And then she waited a year and seven months and she has this very big cancer, lots of calcification going to the nipple. She's going to need a mastectomy. And if we, she came at that year, we might've seen a small mass. 
the problem is, you know, all these people are like, you don't know who's going to be developing the aggressive cancer. So you have to screen a whole population at the moment, right? Because we know 40 year olds, like we said, they're more likely to get aggressive disease, where they're more likely to develop interval cancers for a number of reasons. One, they, like I said, they have fast growing cancers and two, they have dense breast tissues. We know that dense breast tissue makes it harder to see small cancers. So was it not there? Was it obscured by all this dense tissue? Who knows? It's a combination of both. So the two-year interval is not enough, especially in the 40-year-old population. Yeah. I would be okay if, you know, saying 55, you can consider, or 60, consider going every two years, but leave that year option because ultimately going every year lets us see small changes and interval changes. And that's what we're going for. Like that's the whole purpose of a screening um, exam right, is to find people before they're symptomatic, before they feel this lump. So I really think that they need to come down on the, the two-year interval back to one year. I applaud them for, for lowering the age back to 40 and re- acknowledging that they made a mistake. But I think every two years is also a mistake. And I've been very vocal about that. It's, yeah. These are actually only draft recommendations. So yeah. it's pretty interesting. The public has until June 5th to submit their thoughts on these recommendations and have the opportunity to make a change. Hmm. So I'm like, this is my opportunity to get this message across. And they have a website that I'm going to give you the link to so you can include it in the podcast notes where people can submit their thoughts on these recommendations before Hmm. the June 5th uh, deadline. And the final recommendations are going to be released in JAMA. So I'm hoping, especially in the 40-year-old population, we're going to be able to make it every year. And ultimately, they said that this is not going to change insurance coverage. Like, it should not. Insurance should be covering 40 every year for anyone who wants it. Do they do that today? Yes, so, it should be. So the insurance mm-hmm. providers seem to have the right answers on this, at least as it pertains to screening. Yeah. And it's the U.S., PTO that does not. Right. So, So, I mean, American College of Radiology still supports 40 every year in average risk women. There is, like I said, another recommendation that I want to. Yeah. So two other areas of recommendations that we're hearing. One is on sort of at risk populations. Let's talk about that. And then the others are on supplemental screening. Yeah. Let's take those in turn. Okay. So So for the risk recommendations, so these recommendations are for average risk women, but actually recently the Society of Breast Imaging and the American College of Radiology support that all women, especially Ashkenazi Jewish and black women should have a risk assessment with their healthcare provider before the age of 30, ideally by age around age 25, so that we can identify high risk women who would benefit from earlier or supplemental screening. So if you're high risk, so if your risk is over 20% lifetime risk, then you would benefit from starting MRI, like breast MRI as early as age 25 and mammogram as early as age 30, okay? And also a good rule of thumb is like 10 years before a first degree relative. So let's say you don't know your risk factors. Sorry, did you say an MRI? Yeah, so you would start MRI, breast MRI as early as age 25. Yeah, because- we mammograms we typically start at age 30 in asymptomatic women because yeah. the, by that point the breast is definitely done developing so you start mri a little bit earlier and so and then this, once you turn 30 then you're going to be doing i am a mammogram every so usually year, usually every it's every six like yeah it's usually every six months so you do one in january one in june so a mammo for in the, january for the breast for mri risk. recommendation what is the process for something like that going into effect? Are you starting to see referrals? Like, is this something more and more? Where, yeah. You know, because I'm just thinking about I'm a 25 year old woman. I mm-hmm. don't know, kind of just building my career. I don't even know how I would know to think about, yeah, you know, hey, this is right. something I got to do. And are the insurers right. now paying for it? Um, so, so this just means a conversation with your doctor, right? Yeah. At this point, so, and this is but where- But a 25 year old might not be seeing a doctor. I mean, maybe they're seeing their OB. Um, right. So there is a way that people listening that don't have a primary care doctor could figure out their breast cancer or lifetime risk. Okay. So if you if you look up the Tyrakuzic calculator, so it's yeah. T-Y-R-E-R-C-U-Z-I-C-K calculator, you could plug in your own information and kind of get an estimate of what your breast cancer lifetime risk score would be. But I always recommend that you do it with a healthcare provider, especially if you're like approaching that age, 
you know, if you're seeing it getting higher and higher, like a first degree relative with a premenopausal breast cancer, that's a very high risk that might put you over the top just in general. But I do think that like part of my platform is educating not only the patients, but the providers that you need to be doing this because we know that breast cancer is being diagnosed in younger and younger women by about 2% each year. Like we're seeing that. And I see women in their thirties, in their twenties, every week it diagnosed in my practice. So let's say I'm a 25 year old woman, you know, I'm in an at risk category. I'm seeing my mm -hmm. primary care and they're saying, Hey, listen, you you should really consider getting a breast MRI based on this. Yeah. Um, Is my insurance going to pay for it? They should. So I also, if, if you are in that high risk category, at that point, I think I would recommend seeing a breast specialist. And what that means is usually a breast surgeon, they might have a high risk clinic in your institution that are run by nurse practitioners who have extra expertise in this field. Because what you'll see is that primary care doctors, you know, I think everyone assumes that your OB or primary care doctor is really taking care of it, but that's not, they've got so much other things to like look at. So if you are a high risk patient, I really do think that you should see a breast specialist be that proactive patient. That's like, I want someone who's in charge of my breast health. You know, you are your own breast advocate. Like that's yeah. I'm excited by the direction, but call me concerned. Mm -hmm. It has whiffs of the lung cancer screening program where Mm -hmm. we've stratified the risk levels in such a way where you have to meet so many different criteria and to be considered eligible. And so then people just don't know, don't, don't do it. get it, don't jump through right. the hoops. And and you look at the utilization rates, they're sub 10%. And a lot of the populations that you're talking about are going to be poor, less well-educated, you know, less access, let's say, to high quality care, who are yes. in these risk categories. It's concerning. So it's important to do the advocacy work, but I also, we got to find a way to make it easier for folks. Yes. Yes to everything you're saying, right? So African-American, Black the population, they are more likely to develop young breast cancers. And they're also, we know that there are breast cancer disparities on every end of the spectrum, right? Getting an appointment to see their provider, getting an MRI, getting an appointment, all these things. So they're all big problems, but that it's so important. That's why 40 every year in average with women makes the most sense, right? A lot of these women are high risk, have been for 15 years, don't know it walking in for their first mammogram, we need it to be at 40. And it really should be every year because again, more likely to get aggressive cancers. Most of these people are not getting screened with high risk MRI starting at 25. And this is also another thing. And this is why breast self-awareness is important. Okay. So the only way that you're going to get, let's diagnose a breast cancer before the age of 40 is by catching it yourself. So a self breast Mm -hmm. exam makes sense which is, again, where the advocacy part comes in because the American Cancer Society stopped recommending the self-breast exam in 2015 for similar reasons, that women are more likely to find something that's not cancer and make them anxious. But they also say that self-breast awareness makes sense. How could you do that without doing a self-breast exam? We know that 80% of young women find their breast cancers themselves. So yes to the self monthly. 80% of young women who are diagnosed with breast cancer before the age of screening find the breast cancer themselves. So why would you not support a monthly self breast exam, especially if like we're not screening them. So on my platform, the booby docs, I always do feel about the first. It's easy to remember. You know, it's a fun way just to remember, just check yourself. When's the last time you checked yourself? I've started doing this. I've been doing this for the past year and a half. I've had like six people message me to tell me that I help them find their own breast cancer by teaching them how to do the self breast exam, by reminding them and encouraging them that if you find something, talk about with your doctor and don't let them say it's just a cyst or just a clogged up without really like evaluating with imaging because, you know, make sure we have appropriate follow-up and things like that, that your, your, your symptoms are taken seriously because we know that, I mean, medical gaslighting is a thing right now that we hear a lot in, about. I was just quoted in a USA Today article that, you know, medical gaslighting is when a doctor basically dismisses your symptoms without appropriately evaluating them. And this happens a lot. We know this happens a lot with breast cancer, especially in marginalized communities. So young women, old women, minority women. So, you know, it's hard to advocate yourself if a doctor tells you it's nothing, but, you know, I always encourage women, how do you know, is there any imaging tests that we can do to, to clarify that this is nothing to worry about? Like I would feel more comfortable. 
having that conversation, that dialogue with your provider, you know, it's trying to empower people to have that conversation with their provider, to make sure that we are doing everything. Because right, with if you come in with a lump, if it's under 30, we start with an ultrasound. Over 30, we start with a mammogram and ultrasound. And usually we could tell if it's anything that needs to, you know, dealt with just by imaging. So, so um, we covered you know, a lot. The, I'm the sorry. potential, <laughs> no, it's important. Yeah. I'm learning a lot as, as we're talking through this. Mm -hmm. The reasons to push in this area, I think, are clear and evident. Mm -hmm. And everyone yeah. goes about that a different way. You know, many people say, hey, you know, I got to do my part to spread the word. Maybe I'll send some tweets or post on, on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. But very few have been sort of as consistent and taken it to the level and degree that you have. So talk a little bit about what was the motivation to take this from casual to more serious? You know, you now have your own website, you have your own podcast. How did you yeah. get, you know, over the hump from, from A to B? Well, it's, it's a pretty crazy how it's kind of evolved over time. I went to college thinking I was going to be a journalism major. I changed to pre-med at orientation when everybody else in my college class was raising their hand for pre-med. And my parents look at me, they're like, what? I thought you were going to do journalism. <laughs> and my dad, and literally my dad goes, one day you're going to be on the Today Show. You can be a medical journalist on the Today Show. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if he's like the ultimate manifester or I'm the ultimate goody goody. But I, you know, I, in the back of my mind, I've always loved writing. Somewhere after having three kids, I was really kind of lost. You know, I was a few years into my career. I was a little getting bored. I missed, I was like yearning for something and I missed writing and I didn't really know what my voice was yet. I knew I wanted to start a blog, right? Or what we called it back in the day. And I didn't know if, my, if I was a doctor, am I a mom? What am I? And I started something called Dr. Robin Roth. It was like Breast Cancer Awareness Month 2018. That was my first post. And it was like an awkward selfie of me in front of the workstation being like, I'm a radiologist. I'm a breast radiologist because my breast can't, my cousins had breast cancer. And, you know, it was awkward. I posted sparingly over the, you know, the next year or two or three. I didn't know what my voice was. It's really, it's really hard to kind of put yourself out there. Right. So I think the hardest part is just, you know, being consistent and finding your voice. So it was sometime after my third child, I was breastfeeding him. It was during the COVID pandemic, realizing I was surrounded by breasts all day and that I was my audience, like a young woman who's th thinking about breast health, you know, breastfeeding. And I was like, oh my God, the booby doc, the booby. <laughs> and I say doc singular, because at that point it was going to be a solo account. And I was like, yes, like I could talk about breast health. And eventually I changed it to the booby docs. Cause like I said, my longtime best friend from med school works with me. And I was like, we're going to be a joint account. Now we're going to talk about, you know, being moms and, and breast health and being breast friends. And, and she's like, yes. And so that was like in 2020. So beginning with like, you know, right in the heart of the pandemic, we changed it to the booby docs and, you know, we kind of just documented what it's like to be a breast radiologist, what, how we do biopsies and realizing as we did this, our following was growing of actually a lot of breast cancer patients. Like they were mm. getting the information directly from us of what to expect for a biopsy, how to read your mammogram report. What does a BIRADS 4 mean? What does a BIRADS 5 mean? Things like that. And just, it grew completely from there. We jumped on TikTok. We had a lot of viral TikToks which really kind of catapulted us to another level. We were doing this like monthly, weekly Instagram live series on Wednesdays, realizing it was like a lot of women. So we started doing this Woman Crush Wednesday where we would talk to a, someone affected by breast cancer, either a professional or a patient uh, and their you know, friends that were diagnosed. And that got really popular. And someone's like, you should just turn this into a podcast. And we did. And so um, I started a podcast the Booby Docs, The Girlfriend's Guide to Breast Cancer, Breast Health Beyond. So 25 episodes in. Now it's become very clear that it's like designed to help anyone who's navigating a breast cancer diagnosis. You are a loved mm. one. We talk to all the key members of the team. We talk to all the patients. What do you wish you knew? What do you wish you asked? So it's a really informative podcast. I hope you never need it, but if you do, it's there. Um, and just, you know, I've taken, like, it's just kind of become natural. Like, I was recently on Fox News, Good Day Philadelphia, to talk about the new breast cancer screening recommendations. This is something I just, I just love what I'm doing. 
it makes my day-to-day stuff a little bit more interesting. I have all these opportunities like being on your podcast and I do all these public speakings now. I speak to a lot of you know Jewish organizations, women organizations, and I just love that I'm able to do this outside. Of, you know, I work four days a week and in my free time, this is what I like to do. So what's been, the biggest impact, what's been the biggest impact on you after you've kind of started this and any downsides <sighs> that you've found? Yeah, for me, the biggest impact is like finding my voice, finding my confidence. Like I just turned 40. I feel like I'm coming into my own. Like I have a big following of just, and like wherever I go, I get recognized and that's really cool, you know, but it has its problems too, right? But for the most part, I just love it. I mean, and in terms of the negatives, listen, putting yourself out there is hard. Not everyone is going to love everything you do. Even the word booby is conflicting, right? Like every so often I have somebody that's like, this is feels inappropriate. And the truth is like, I understand your concerns. Like this is how I'm reaching a young audience who need this breast information. I, I think that if you could just accept that and know that I use the word booby endearingly. My grandma used to call breast boobies. This is how I describe my job to my doctor. I always used to say I'm a booby doc. So, you know, putting yourself out there in a way, like it's not for everyone, right? Like you're never going to make every person happy, but you also just have to know at the end of the day, like you're being authentic and real, you know, keeping it professional, but also, you know, keeping your finger on the pulse of what's going on. Like I do get ready with me videos while I talk about some important things because that's what people do. Like that's how do you getting a big audience? You kind of have to jump on trends a little bit in order to get your message to the young population. But ultimately, I think that, you know, a 25 year old might find my account for whatever reason, whether they like, I did a silly dance and they like that, but then they stick around for like the good information. So just knowing internally what I'm doing is what I want to do and helps people is like the most rewarding thing. Yeah. There's so much of that rings true from my experience as well. Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, that little anxiety about putting yourself out there. And I think the the way that you said it around finding your voice is the most interesting Mm -hmm. that resonates with me. You know, you're like, oh, well, I started this show, but I didn't know exactly what it would be. And now I've sort of figured it out. And for me, it's definitely been chasing my curiosity. Like I learned more from a 30 minute conversation with you about the state of the state with breast imaging guidelines, the pros and the cons than I could have, you know, staying abreast of all the journals. And so for me, it's like a really high impact way to learn. Um, yes. personally. And I figure if people are listening alongside this journey with me, then they're also probably learning at the same rate. And so the things I'm interested in learning, people are also going to find. A hundred percent. You don't have to know your voice when you start, you find your voice. Yeah. Okay. So, but it comes so from kinda, the consistency. It comes from consistency and really kind of like reflecting on like, who are you at your core? I'm more yeah. than a radiologist, right? I'm a mom. I'm a 40 year old woman. I'm an advocate, like, you know, I have all this knowledge that I want to share with a large population. I wish I started this earlier. Like, I wish I documented my struggle of my radiology residency. Like when I failed physics, you know, it it feels a little out of place to talk about it, you know, 15 years later, but it's important. Like it was, or my transferring, you know, I wish I was able to document that in an authentic way while I was in the thick of it, because now I look back, I'm like, oh yeah, right. I transferred. Like, but like <laughs> you know, it's important for people to hear your, your failures yeah. as well as your successes. And I try to be an open book on, you know, social media as much as I can, because I think that's what resonates with people. Well, my my final question for you is going to be, what advice do you have for young parents who are navigating their career? And what's funny is, as I do this, my vomiting child has entered the uh, room regularly. Are you <laughs> okay? The podcast camera and crawled under my chair. He said he's hungry, which I think is his cue for me to wrap things up. Hopefully you can think, keep this meal down. Yeah, I think that, you know, balancing it all is really hard. And like, there's no perfect balance. Like some days I'm more... I'm out of balance and I have to kind of check myself. Like it's easy to get what swept away and do the booby docs all the time. But I have to remember that my priorities are my, my family, my job, and then the booby docs. I think compartmentalizing it a lot is important. You know, when I'm home with my kids, I try to put my phone away, especially in that critical hour when, between when you get home from work and, and bedtime, like you get, so, you know, so little time with your kids and they're, you're, they're only young once, like I have eight, five, three-year-olds. So, 
you know, I, I try my best to always be home for bedtime whenever possible. And, you know, then after that, like, is my booby docs time. Then I could, you know, I typically post at night or I schedule my posts so that, you know, I don't have to think about it as much as I used to, because it's easy to like perseverate on it and obsess over it. So trying to keep a balance. I actually just, re- I just learned that I have adult ADHD. I probably been that my whole life. In some ways, I think it makes me the successful person that I am, but at the same time, like, you know, I feel like a scatterbrain person 90% of the time. So just trying to like be present and be, you know, when I'm doing, when I'm with my family, be try to really, really hard, hard focus on my family. When I'm at work, I really hard, focus hard on my work. And same thing with the booby docs. I try to like batch it or, you know, schedule it ahead of time. So I'm not always just like, I have a, you know, tendency to daydream about things you know, oh, that would be a good post and try to, you know, yeah. write it down and put it somewhere else so I can move on with my life. Well, it's great advice. I feel like I've been very diligent about putting the phone away from those post-work to bedtime hours, but I've fallen off the wagon a little bit the it's last hard. year. It's so, so I need hard. to take your advice to heart this week and make that yeah. uh, another part of my my daily practice. And I think I'll tr- the I'll do consistency the piece <laughs> is so good. Like, for us, we've gotten onto a schedule of posting every Wednesday. And mm-hmm. so now, okay, you got a deadline, we got to do it. And and that I think helps for people who have kind of over commitments. It's like you, you kind yeah. of pick a commitment that you know you can stick to. Um, right. As well. Yeah. I, I, I don't do well when I post every day and I don't think people want that. So it's like, for yeah. me, I try to post like three times a week. And when I do it, I kind of do it across all platforms. So, so making it like a cross platform thing. It's more unified that way, you know, and recycling the posts for Facebook or Reels and and TikTok is important. Well, Dr. Robin Roth, this has been so much fun (laughs) and we will follow, share and promote the booby docs as well. It's really important work. And it sounds like now is as an important time as there's ever been as we navigate the shifting guidelines and then do the important work of educating the community, referring providers, patients around the world about how to integrate these new guidelines into their daily lives so that we can save more lives. So it's yes. really important work and we are grateful Thank you. for doing it. <laughs> Thank you so much for speaking with me. This was such a great opportunity. And I obviously, I love anyone from South Florida. So we got that. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Radiology Report podcast. Be sure to visit us at the radiologyreportpodcast.com or subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcasts to join us for our next episode. We are always looking for great guests. If you have someone you'd like to hear on the show, please get in touch with us online.